Hi, I'm Tom Cherry Holmes, and I'm just a hacker having fun. In this demo, I'm actually going to show you uh, the process that I'm using here to create not only my programs and things and forth, but also the tools used to make them. It's very advantageous to make your own tools and forth, and you actually need to because forth is actually a self-contained environment. In this case, I'm actually going to show how I went through the process of creating my uh, Antic Disassembler and what I use it for. What is a disassembler? Well, a disassembler basically takes all of this compact data that computers store and all these wonderful hexadecimal numbers here, and it takes and presents a symbolic representation of that information so that uh, human beings can actually read them and understand it a bit better. Why do I need to make this tool? Well, it's I needed something to be able to see the antic display list in a meaningful way and I needed to be able to debug my own dis display list problems as time went on. Well, what is antic actually? Uh, Manic is the chip inside the Atari 8-bit that manages the display of the Atari computer. It is a simple, finite state machine, not quite a microprocessor because it doesn't alter anything, but it just reads instructions out of memory to show how to display each line on the display. And it does this every single video frame. Well, what types of instructions do we have here? Uh, well, we have mode instructions. Uh, which which specify which mode to display on each line. We have blank line instructions which say to display from one to eight scan lines and we have jump instructions which basically say to jump to another location in memory for a particular reason or not. Now from this point on basically all numbers that we talk about here for the sake of convenience are expressed in hexadecimal. Mode instructions. Well Mode instructions basically display a specific graphics mode on a line. There are 14 of them, modes 2 through F. Uh, as we'll see later, modes 0 and 1 are used for a specific purpose, for specific purposes. And in addition, mode instructions can also specify a location in memory to grab, you know, the next bit of screen data. Uh, this is what's known as a load memory store instruction. And there can be as many of these load memory store instructions in the display list as need be. So you can grab different parts of the display from different parts in memory. This alone makes the Atari a very powerful machine for doing graphics work. It allows you to do a lot of wonderful little tricks. Now, blank scan lines are basically just anything from one to eight blank scan lines that you can possibly do and they have specific instructions for them. As you can see right here, from 00, zero to 70. We're actually going to use this particular um, pattern here to take and make a computation to be able to quickly uh, display whether or not this is one to eight scan lines. Basically shifting everything over to the right as need be. Jump instructions are used to resume the execution of a display list at some other point in memory. It's used in two different cases. The first is a special one to jump across a 4K boundary. Antic, Antic's address counter basically only works up to 4K. Well, if you're doing a, this is for every load memory store. So if you look at a high resolution display on the Atari, that takes more than four kilobytes of memory. So you have to put a jump instruction in the middle of the display list to jump to the next section of memory. JVB, on the other hand, is used at the end of each and every display list to jump back to the beginning of the display list after the vertical blank happens. This is used for two different purposes. One, it's to make sure that the antic always executes the display list in a loop, but it also makes sure that because this happens after the vertical blank that this happens in time with the video display once the video display has finished drawing. There are two different instruction sizes inside uh, the Antic. There are one byte instructions and there are three byte instructions. One byte instructions are used by blank lines as you saw before and mode lines without the LMS bit set.
Three byte instructions, on the other hand, they contain an address. Basically, it's the instruction plus the address. And the address, because we're working on a 6502, is stored little endian. That is least significant bit first, least significant byte first. So, in addition to the jump instructions, you also have the mode lines with the LMS bit set so that you can, say, grab the screen from this address over here. Pretty simple. Now, one byte instructions are basically divvied up like follows. The first four bits, counting from the right here, are essentially the mode selection bits, 2 through F. 0 and 1 are used for blank lines and jump, in, jump instructions, respectively. And we test for those separately. H scroll means that this line needs to scroll horizontally. V scroll means that the line needs to scroll vertically. LMS means that this is an LMS instruction and that there is an address after it. And DLI is very special. I won't go into the details here, but I will go into it in a future tutorial, basically, stating that the next line after this one should fire an interrupt from the antic. This can be used, for example, to uh, cause the processor to execute a piece of uh, code to change color registers, change character sets, that sort of thing, to do complex screen manipulations in time with the horizontal lines on the display. A very powerful tool indeed. And this is essentially the nucleus of a single byte instruction. That's it. Three byte instructions, pretty simple. All we do is add the address onto the end of it. LMS instructions are basically the desired mode plus the LMS bit, also known as add 40 hacks. So 4240BC means mode 2 LMS fetch from address BC40. Uh, also from the jump instruction, 0100B0 jump to address B000, etc. And as you can see here, it's pretty straightforward, but we do have to keep this in mind when we're disassembling these instructions to provide a more symbolic uh, representation of them. Now, we have a plan of attack that we need to do here. What is our plan of attack? Well, in fourth, fourth is all about creating words to do what we need and to put those words into a useful vocabulary. Well, what kind of words do we need? Well, we need low-level words for testing the instructions and their extra bits. For example, is this a one-byte instruction? Is it a three-byte instruction? Is this a, uh, you know, is the DLI bit set, is the V-scroll bit set, is H-scroll set, is the LMS bit set, etc. And finally, we have words that display prompts and annotate individual instructions. If it's a jump instruction, we need the address. If it's a JVB, we also need the address. If it's a mode instruction, we need to know what mode it is. If it's a number of blank lines, we want to know how many blank lines are on the or, or how many blank lines are specified in the instruction. And finally, we have words that compute where the next instruction comes from, or how many, or or to calculate certain things like how many blanks there actually are. Once we create the words we need, we test each one to make sure that they work. We observe their effects on the stack. We make sure that they're uh, consuming the right number of bits, on, number of things off the stack, and we make sure that they're putting the right number of things onto the stack for the next word that needs to use them. And finally, we take and build the word that ties it all together. Well, what kind of words do we need? Well, we need words that test for specific instructions. J is it a JVB? Is it a jump? Is this a blank line instruction? Those are, of course, tested first. Then we take and create words that uh, just test and display the extra bits, uh, H scroll, V scroll, LMS, DLI, etc. I'm using a naming convention here uh, to put the question mark at the beginning of them, uh, primarily so that I can know that, oh, these words are supposed to return true or false, depending on whether the byte that's passed into them is a particular type of instruction, or whether or not a particular instruction has these extra bits set. We also test for a 3-byte instruction. Uh, we have one here that is 3-byte, 
I don't have one for is one byte because I assume that if it's not a three byte instruction, then it is a one byte instruction. We can make that instruction, we can make that assumption because we know what we're disassembling. Finally, we have display words for uh, displaying the, the mode for a mode instruction, the extra bits that might be a part of a mode instruction. Uh, if it's a blank instruction, how many blanks are there? If it's a jump instruction, what's the address? If it's a JVB, what's the address? The address word that actually is shared between those two uh, to show what address is there. Uh, PC, which uh, is a short for program counter. And finally, the higher level words such as instruction, which take uh, an input stream of an, a full-blown three-byte instruction and parse it, display it out. Header, which I use just for uh, cosmetic purposes to basically say this is a display list and display list which basically goes through and loops through the display list until it finds the JVB instruction at the bottom. And finally we have computation words which are used by display list, the last word there, to figure out okay what's the next instruction? Fetch it. Put it on the stack for me so I can pass it into instruction to decode it. And finally, uh, left and shift, which are treated as uh, together to be able to take and shift a, uh, or sorry, right and shift, I need to take and change that to shift everything over so that uh, the blanks and everything get shifted over properly. We need to be able to do this efficiently. We need to be able to use the stack to our advantage. This means that when we grab an instruction, I make next always pass a three byte instruction. If it's a one byte instruction, we simply put a zero in the address. We do this so I don't have to take and make conditionals inside of my instruction decoder to say, is this a three byte instruction? And use that also in next. Essentially, it means I only have to check for a three byte instruction in one place, in next. This is the essence of fourth, trying to refactor things to make them simpler so you don't redundantly use things all over the place. So you don't have to. So you don't have to carry uh, more information in more than one place and use it exactly as efficiently as possible. And once a, an instruction is displayed, we always have two bytes in the stack. The last instruction sends its LMS so we can test it to see if it's a JVB. And if it's not, we still have the next relative memory address in, uh, we still have the next relative memory address on the stack. So we can loop right back around and test and, and decode the next instruction. It makes our looping construct really simple, as we'll see in the code.